given didn't help. Thank you. Tried uh, all kinds of methods of, you know, kids. It didn't help. He was devastated. His fellow fellow children who seemed to be able to relate to happiness and, to, and serenity and peace didn't succeed in getting this child, you know, get back to himself. He was continuously crying and crying and it was very difficult to deal with. One day, the announcement was made that King George VI, who became a king in 1936, four years before the war, the Second World War broke out. He died in 1952, and then we have Queen Elizabeth who took over. But king George VI was, good, was a very good person, a uh, benevolent king. He decided one day that he's going to take his visits and meet all the villages, the orphanages. The kids were in an orphanage, homes and orphanages. He's going to have a whole procession, entourage. People are going to salute and cheer the king when he comes by on the royal carriage. And when this little barrel heard that, he calmed down. Nobody knew why. He had a little secret. What happened? As soon as the procession took place, people were behind barricades. It was illegal, obviously, to uh, jump over the barricades. And they had pretty high barricades to make sure people are contained. The barrel was watching, watching very you know, carefully as the king goes around, making his rounds with music and cheering and saluting and finally the carriage, the royal carriage passes by and Beryl breaks right through the barricades, unleashes his full energy, doesn't turn right, doesn't turn left, doesn't run, jumps and flies over people and runs towards the carriage and is about to jump onto the carriage when the guard stopped him. The royal guard stopped him. Who knows what this kid wants to do? And the kid started crying, screaming, leave me alone. I want to see the king. And the king overheard the commotion. And he asked his guards, what's going on over here? And there was a little child who says he wants to see the king. And he seems to be, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe he's dangerous. So the king says, don't worry. Let him come up on the carriage. Child is brought up, brought up on the carriage. As soon as he sees the king, he starts crying. Finally calms down and he says, I want to thank you for saving my life, but I miss my parents. I can't live without them. I miss them. I want to see them again. Can you bring my parents back to England? So the king says, I would love to do that. Oh, I only wish I can do that. But the war has just broke out. We're fighting Germany right now. I can't. I can't. But you're the king. You can do anything you want, the case this barrel says to the king. You're the king. You are all powerful. There's nothing you can't do. The king was very moved by that. And he said, what's your name? What's your mother's name? What's your father's name? Give me the address. I'll see what I can do. He heard those words, did his job, went back to the orphanage. He was scared that he's going to get punished. And several months later, he gets called by the front office of the orphanage. Uh-oh, I'm going to be punished for breaking the rules. What I did was really illegal. I'm afraid of what they have in mind in store for me. But when he arrived there, this fellow, the leader of the orphanage, the one who was in charge, says, I want to let you know, Beryl, that the king was very impressed with your courage and your persistence is very, he wants to give you a present. Present, what kind of present? And the door opens and in comes his, in comes his parents. And Beryl is united with his mommy and his tati once more. That's the story. What does it have to do with Chedesh Elul? Mm -hmm. The king is visiting his subjects. He's not in his royal palace. He's visiting the city, the villages, wants people to salute, but he's also welcoming. And there are guards, there are royal guards that might say to you, and there are barricades. We have all kinds of barricades that we build up. I'm not fit, I'm not ready for Rosh Hashanah. I, I know what I did a month ago. You know, summer was, uh, I, I have all kinds of obstacles, whether they're physical, whether they're mental, whether they're psychological, whether they're social anxieties and all kinds of issues. I can't approach the king. 
It's illegal for me. It would be wrong for me to do that. And of course, there are guards who won't let me. Spiritual guards, I guess. Maybe it's the malachim, the angels. We learn from Beryl that um, in Chaydesh Elul, we're told, don't allow the barricades to affect you. Jump over. It might be sort of illegal. Don't worry. Forget about the guards. The king wants to see you. He wants to hear from you. And if you really mean it, if you're really sincere, that you want to go back to your parents. What are your parents? Back to our past, to our real true self, who we really are. Sometimes we call the, our intelligence versus our emotions. Emotions are children and our, and our seichel, chachma and bina are our parents. And we do things that are wrong. You know, we do, we follow our instincts, follow our emotions the rest of the year. And we don't follow what our brain tells us, what our natural kids tells us to do. So we want to see our parents again. We want to be reunited with our true self, our true core. And when, when that's, when it's real, when it comes from the bottom of your heart and you override all the obstacles, the king welcomes you. And even if it might seem that even he can't help you, by us saying, you're omnipotent, you could do anything, God, that triggers that power of Hashem being omnipotent to the forefront and he takes care of you and gives you a good and sweet year. Now, it's interesting in the Shemineser of Musa of Rosh Hashanah, we say Uvechein, the word Uvechein four times, four different paragraphs, Uvechein and thus, do this and this, Tein Pachtecha, Uvechein, 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 you'll see four paragraphs and each paragraph begins with the word Uvechein, which means and therefore, and thus. The fourth one is related to the Uvechein in Megillah's Esther. And Esther tells Mordechai, I can't go in. I wasn't summoned for 30 days. It's against the law. But she did go in. She finally said, okay, I will acquiesce. I will listen to you. Uvechein, and thus, I will come to the king. And we all know that refers to the king of all kings. When Megillah calls, says the word king, it means God. Esther represents the Jewish people. I can't. I haven't been summoned. Who says I'm wanted? There are barricades. Esther broke the rules. Asherloi kados, not according to the rules. And what happened as a result? You have a yant of Purim. So we should all inter break our own little barricades that we build and believe that we are too small. We're not fit to enter into the, to the yant of Rosh Hashanah. Who are we? You know, we feel very... And by the way, feeling so humble is very healthy. A girl, uh, six years ago, there was a girl in the a class who started almost crying. She said, Rabbi, I'm not ready for Rosh Hashanah. I said, if you're crying about that, you are more ready than I am, by the way. Uh, if you're crying about the fact that you're not ready, that's the best way of being ready. But although we are, you know, we're serious, we don't lose, lose ourselves and believe that we're too small and who are we anyways? As we'll see in the sense of the Sikha really raises every single Jew to the, to the highest level. Um, I wanted to, before we, start, before we start, I want to just make sure we have everyone here. Uh, Ronit, is Ronit uh, Nisanov in this class? Alexis, Ruiz, Beth Shapiro, Sharon Suntag, um, kind of here. Um, just curious, like, I took attendance virtually. I'm doing it myself. Oh, okay. I'm old fashioned. I, I do see pen. Like, <laughs> I'll never learn. Mayan Hazan. Remy Jungreis. I'm just going to okay, fine. But get the, to learn. Okay. So I just want to, I want to, I like to know myself who's who. Uh, Kitty Margolin, my Basia, Mary, my other class. Okay. You're this class, right? Leia Ferdman, not here. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we need to see how the seat is an extra copy here. You can give it out. All of you know the 10 reasons why we blow chauffeur. You should remember from last year, Nadia. You have, an, you have a photographic memory. Close, phenomenal memory. <laughs> what was the question? 
יש עשרה טעמים על מה שתוקעים בשופר. You know all the ten? No. Who knows ten reasons? Oh, what you also have got about you. <laughs> you, you, have to, huh? you, have, you have it written? Yeah. <laughs> That's cheating. I'm not looking, I'm not. Who knows the ten reasons? Who knows any reasons? Yes, Connor. To, um, to, about us to come to, like, to Shuma, to wake up the song. Okay, it's an awake, awake, yeah. Well, let, me, let me go in order. Because okay. there's, there's an order. Reason number one is the reason that we know best in Chabad, and that is to coronate the king, because it was customary that when the king would be coronated, it would be a lot of trumpets, a lot of musical sounds blown. The second reason is the 10 days of Chuba are beginning. We want to make that announcement that the Aseris Yemei Chuba, the 10 days of repentance, have arrived as of Rosh Hashanah. It's an announcement. Shofar is like an announcement. Number three. Number three is a reminder of, that's number six. Very good, very good. Number three is a reminder of Har Sinai, because when we were standing at the foot of Sinai, we heard the sounds of Shofar. And we were Naseb and Ishma, we were totally submissive and we surrendered our whole identity to God. Recall, try to picture that, that standing, try to picture that, that scenario. And that's a very good way of entering into the new year. So the shaper blowing reminds us of that shaper blowing. Four is not well known. Words of the prophets. Prophets are sometimes referred to as shofar blowing. They keep us a check. They tell us, be careful, or this will happen. Don't do this, or this will happen. So they are like the voice of the shofar. So it's like heed to the words of the prophets. The fifth, remind us of the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. Because when we were fighting and the wars were going on, we heard a lot of sounds that sound something like the chauffeur sounds, you know, scary sounds. Chauffeur scares you and that also. So that's a reminder of the Chorten Beis Amikdash. Then what Chai Rezel said, right, that name right? Chai Rezel. I have a relative that, that name. Um, what did you say? It was a Kedash Yitzchak, right? To remind ourselves of the shofar, which the ram's horn that Avram took in place of Yitzchak, the schos of Yakeda. We want that to stand in good stead. Number seven, eight. What's number seven? I think you were saying number seven. The voice of the shofar wakes us up. It alerts us. It cajoles. It just gets us out of our weekday mindset and raises us up to a Shabbos mindset. You look at my brother's. Uh, I don't know if you looked at it, but if you looked at it, it's, it wakes you out of your natural daily routine self and raises the person up to a whole, whole different level of living. You're defined not by your weekdays, but by your Shabbos. Everyone keeps Shabbos and we go to work during the week. Well, how do you define yourself as a weekday person or a Shabbos person? Is Shabbos just whew, one day off, get back to the normal lifestyle, which is next week? You're living during the week and Shabbos is a day off just to get back to back to normal again? Or is the weekday foreign to you? And Shabbos is your cup of tea. You only wish every day was Shabbos. In fact, you count to Shabbos. Like we say, the Shir Shalom, Hayom, Yom, Rishon, Hayom, Today is the second day of the week, the third day of the week, meaning the third day towards Shabbos. It's almost like you're counting. Counting Sphira towards Shabbos. Every day is, a, is a, a pathway to Shabbos. You're living with Shabbos. Shabbos defines you. Not Shabbos is not what you do, it's who you are. The shofar helps us read that level. Number eight. Very good. Mashiach. Mashiach, Mashiach. I, I. Then there's another one. It's a reminder of the fact that there's going to be a shofar blowing before God will judge all the anti-Semites, all those that hurt the Jews of the past. They will get their just due. Shofar will be blown right before that. God will take, avenge the blood of all the Jews that were persecuted and murdered. And then there is, how many do we have? Nine. 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 We have nine already? No, we're on nine. We're on nine. Okay. Oh, wait. No, we did nine. nine. Yeah. The final one is Chiesa Before the resurrection of the dead, there'll be a shofar blowing again. Sicha. The Sicha is a powerful Sicha we did last year actually, but it's a sicha you can do again and again and again and again and you never get tired of it. The sicha 
from Tanakh, Shmuel Aleph, all about Hannah and Eli. Elkanah was the husband of Hannah. We'll just go over a little bit that. And this, the um, Elkanah would visit Mishkan Shiloh. The Mishkan was located for 369 years in a city called Shiloh. It's called Mishkan Shiloh. This is before the building of the first base of Mikdash, before David came around. In fact, Shmuel, the child of Khanna, who she prayed for, was the one to anoint and coronate David HaMelech as king, like by Shaul HaMelech, and then he, that didn't work out so well. So we're talking about years before the first place of Migdash. 369 years includes most of the years where the Mishkan wandered. It was in Nob and Givon and Gilgal for several years, but most of the 400 years, 369, not 400, a little more than 400, most of the 400 plus years that the Jews wandered before they had the first place of Migdash, 369 of those years, it was in Shiloh, it's called Mishkan Shiloh. And the story goes that Elkanah had a, a wife, Penino, who had many children, and he had another wife, Hannah, who didn't have any children. And she was very much in pain and she grieved a lot. Uh, she cried a lot, she was bitter. It tells a story that one day, as he's coming up for pilgrimage during the Halloween festivals, he brought a whole bunch of people with him, including his own family, and his wife is not eating. Hannah is not eating. And he says, why are you, why not, Lama Nafla Panecha, why are you so down? By the way, I have one of the copies of, uh, of the Tanakh, I have it there also. Why are you so down? And he says powerful words to her, which I not relate to very well. Hello, Anochi, I am, my relationship with you is worth more than 10 children. My love for you, and he loved her very deeply. I, my love and my relationship with you is so deep why are you crying? Of course, questions like that you can't really answer. She didn't respond. She went right away. She was crying in, internally and also weeping, tears, and she ran towards the Mishkan. She stood by the Heichal, who was standing there watching her, Eli. And Eli reprimands her. That's a strange part. He reprimands her, and what does he say? At Masai how long will you be a drug addict or an alcoholic addict? How long will you be involved in being inebriated and intoxicated? Why are you smashed? That's what it sounds like he's saying. Remove your wine. Get rid of your wine. Get rid of your alcoholic beverage. You're standing in a holy place. Come on. Three questions. What were the three questions? Obvious questions. Come on. Even an average person would make a mistake, misjudge a person who's brokenhearted to call that person a drug addict. I mean, an alcoholic, a drunkard. You know, you're not just once, you, you, you're, you have a whole system of, uh, you know, this is who you are. And Ailey was a shofet. He was like the leader of the generation. A shofet is someone who has to be very careful about judging people, looking beyond the surface, seeing deeper. That's what a judge is all about. Seeing the MS, seeing the truth behind the scenes. He was also a Kohen. Kohen are known very well for their being able to meditate. They're deep thinkers. The Levi, as we mentioned last week, were loud in their musical singing. They sang a lot. They used their voices. The Kohana were quiet, silence, still. They were meditating. So these are big people who think very deep. How could a person like that, he was a Kohen Gogol. So amongst the aloof, he was aloof within the aloof. Kohen Gogol doesn't leave the Beit HaMikdash during the day, even for a Levi, even for a funeral of his own family members. It's like, how could you ask that? completely uh, removed, isolated from, from society. And a person like that, obviously, is deep. It's not going to judge someone so easily. How is it possible? Yes. Well, that's the second question. If he really believes she was drunk, why did he wait? Okay, I, I'm saying that's, that proves it wasn't real wine. Because if you really believe she was drunk, you don't wait till she finishes her, you know, her, whatever she's doing, venting her, her, her shik shikrus. You stop her. Respectfully, you say, Madame, uh, Hanale. <laughs> Yala, you know. <laughs> and have someone, a, a woman, to take her out. You don't just let her finish her, you know, you're not allowed to. The sons of Aaron passed away because of that. And thirdly, why would the Torah, why would the half Torah, which is a lesson in life, want to disparage, put down such an important person like Ailey? Ailey was a kind goggle. Doesn't look good. 
Torah is careful about the dignity of, even of an animal, not a kosher animal. It's, it shies away from calling a trait animal trait. So what about a person? What about a Jew? What about a tzaddik? What about Elia Cohen? Just get to the point. Hannah begged for children, and, he, and she was blessed with Shmuel. Why the whole exchange between Hannah and Elia? Why is that mentioned? It puts Elia you know, in a bad light. So the Rebbe says, obviously, this tells us that it wasn't he wasn't accusing her of being shikir. He was accusing her of something else entirely, much deeper. He was accusing her of being intoxicated with herself, not with wine. You know, he used the word wine, meant it as a metaphor. Just like wine can make you lose yourself, you're lost. You're forgetting where you are. I know you're davening for children. I know you must be brokenhearted, but wait a second. You're davening because you need certain things. Can't you put away these needs? After all, you're standing in a holy place. Some say it was even Rosh Hashanah. It wasn't according to the Shalom. This was actually on Rosh Hashanah. And in a holy place, you couldn't find any better time to express your needs and your broken heart about what you need in life. You're intoxicated with your needs. That was why. And we'll see later on how deep Ailey really was. And, and, and uh, although he was 100% right, Hannah said, based on exactly, I agree with you, Ailey. But because I agree with you, I fully disagree with you. And we have to see that part. Before we get there, let's go back to where we left off. And that is on page, the second page, uh, the, um, yeah, the second page, Dawid. Didn't do it inside. Shnei on Yon and Mrs. Dawid on page 314, the second column. Shnei on Yon and Mrs. Dawid. Shnei on We find two convert, two opposite paradoxical aspects of the day that don't seem to make sense how they can both be part of the same day. On one hand, on the one, on the one side of the spectrum, Rosh Hashanah, it's a day of judgment for all human needs. Spiritual needs and material needs. Interesting pasuk. Simply translated, this is a day Established, chok means an established day for the Jewish people. It's a day of judgment by God. That's the simple meaning of the words. But it's translated in Gemara differently. Chok, the word chok can mean a statute, but it could also mean food. Where do we find the word chok, ches, kuf, can mean related to food? We find in Eov. Eov, chapter 30, I think. Eov says... To God, I don't want wealth. I don't want poverty. Just give me my basic needs. Hatri feini, feed me, provide for me. Hatri feini, lechem chuki, the ration of my bread, my allotment of bread. The bread doesn't only mean bread; it means all food. Doesn't only mean food; it means all my material needs. Just give me whatever I need. I don't want wealth. I don't want poverty. I want wealth. I just, I just want to live normal. And the word he used, lechem chuki, oh. So go back to the Pasuk and Tehillim. When it says Chok Yisrael, Chok means food, physical, material needs. There's a judgment for that. Mishpat Leke Yaakov. Not that the Mishpat is by God, the God of Jacob. No. There's a judgment of how much godliness you're going to feel the next year. How are you going to relate to, to Leke? How much are you going to feel Leke Yaakov? A Mishpat of Ruchnius. How your Ruchnius is going to go. How your Daphne is going to go. Are you going to feel the Ashraq of practice? Are you going to feel uplifted spiritually? That's also, they, they have that kind of judgment as well. So, Chokli Yisraelu, that's Gashmias, Mishpat Leleke Yaakov, a judgment of how much godliness, how much God relates to you, is also on Rosh Hashanah. Milam Shon, look inside the Sifa. Uh, Kakosu, this is a Pasuk in Tilin, 16. This is actually the Thursday every Thursday we say this Pasuk. Eu says to God, provide me, provide for me. The bread, i.e. my material needs, that I have been allotted, but God has a portion to me. I want that, I don't need any more than that. Hamishpat it's the mishpat, the ruling, the judgment, the yem hatin for mazonos, for sustenance and material needs. Well, mishpat of the keyakov, who mishpat al inyonim ruchnim, on page three fifteen. The mishpat of the keyakov is the judge, 
judgment about how much God will you feel, how much of God will you feel? How is your spiritual you're going to be? Al dargas a level of the revelation of godliness in your life. The fichach mevachshim we find it feels Rosh Hashanah we daven Rosh Hashanah al banei chaye umezoni on children, on life and on sustenance. Three major requirement needs that people need. The gam al haslacha we also ask for haslacha on spiritual matters. We want to also feel spiritual. On the one hand. We dive in about ourselves. We have very powerful needs. Mitzat Shani, on the other hand, on the other side, on the second side, meaning on the other side of the spectrum, it is well known. The main avoid of Rosh Hashanah, Hamizbatas, that is expressed, the eker, primarily Bitvila, who hachtorat hakarosh baruchu lemelech. We recrown Hashem as king. God says, please crown me, grief, coronate me. Shetam lichuni alechem. I'm asking you, do something to make me want to be your king. Kenema b'tfilo Rosh Hashanah, as we say in the tefillah, throughout the davening, quite often. Melocha la'olam kula b'chweidecha. Rule over the world with your honor. People should see that you're the one in charge. Make us feel like you're in charge. Melcha kol ha'aretz, you're the king of the entire world. But oh, there are many, many more psukim. You know, you look through the parts of the davening and the repetition with the chazal and say extra things. It's melech, melech, melech all over the place. Right. Now, when you're coronating the king, as I mentioned last week, there's no room to talk about your needs. He's not yet your leader. You first have to make him your leader. I'll give an example. You know, even today, if you have, let's say, imagine you have someone who's uh, running for president. I know it's hard to imagine in this generation. Imagine if the right and the left both want him. The person is benevolent and the person could save the, save the country. And people see what a great leader this person is. But he doesn't want to run doesn't want to run <laughs> he needs to be urged on to run he needs to be bothered and the people are begging and begging and begging so you can imagine if while this coronation inauguration is taking place where he's about to accept if someone says oh by the way king you know there are a lot of potholes on my street and i have a lot of this and i you take care of them wrong time that you do after he's accepted the coronation and after he's already you know running the show He's not yet your king. So it doesn't make any sense for us to express our needs. If we don't feel ourselves, we feel completely submissive to the king. We shouldn't feel, there shouldn't be any dominating about ourselves. The entire Shvanesa should be just about how his kingship should run. They want him to be our king. That's it. The Akhtara, the crowning of the king and his acceptance of his leadership, absolute submission. Surrendering, ukniya, and subjugation, clap off towards him. We don't even feel that we have any needs. Our only need is to be one with him, that he should be our melech. That's it, nothing else. His battle is though, it's this type of total submission where we get lost in the picture, we lose ourselves. This is what triggers and provokes within the king the desire to be our king. When we become one with him, he returns, reciprocates, and becomes one with us and accepts our plea. Now, that being the case, dabbling for our knees, begging Hashem, we want to live, we want to have this, we want to have that, even Ruchnius, it's also your personal needs. It's also personal. A good part of the world is not, not with this. You know, outside of Chabad, you'll hear the uh, language of Elam Haba is the ultimate. Get your Elam Haba, get your, pick up the dividends. You know, it's very much promoted the idea of why did Hashem create the world? Why did he create you in this world? So you should serve him and get your reward due in the next world. Or you want to become, uh, you know, you want to have a success in your learning Torah. You love learning Torah. You want to be successful in Torah learning. That's still a self-expressed, still self-expression. It's your me, 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 me. It's just about a different kind of more refined me, but it's still about yourself. And when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, we should put ourselves aside completely. <laughs> These two above mentioned themes of Rosh Hashanah, on the one hand, we daven very hard for ourselves. The men of great assembly instituted that we should daven for ourselves. 
Why are these things paradoxical and, and contradictory? Because when you're standing in a complete bittel to the king, you can't think about yourself. And thus, you can't think about having needs. Which are connected to your personal will. I don't have any will. I'm not there. There's a oneness with the with the melech. And the same thing is true with it's, it's true about Gashmias, which is, by the way, the most important focal point of the day of Rosh Hashanah. That's what it says in Agoy Smaimini in the commentary in the Rambam about Philip Bitzrachim Ruchnim. Then he goes on and says a powerful statement here, a very sharp statement from the Zohar. It says in the Zohar that people that ask for their needs. Those that are mavakish on Yom Kippur, it says, al on sustenance, please forgive us, atone for our sins, give us life, and that's all they're thinking about. They're like dogs that are barking and say, give, 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 more food and more food. So the Zayar compares people who daven for their needs on Yom Kippur, same thing with Shoshana, I guess the same way, are like dogs that are barking for their food. They are completely self-centered and they're thinking about themselves. Thank you. So on the one hand, we're told to forget, put yourself aside completely. Who established these filoi? It's not we. The Chazal, our sages did. Why? With their explaining, this is the most auspicious time for all your needs to be fulfilled. The miloi habakoshis. Chaparai and daven for all things you need in life. We can't move on. Now, it's, you can't say, well, maybe it's just Daven because Hashem said so. You don't really have any need, but he wants you to daven anyways. That's not, that's fake. If we're told to daven, davening means you express your feelings. If I don't really have any needs, I'm not thinking about my needs. I'm just saying words. That's robotic. We're not robots. It has to be if the, if the chazal or sages are saying, daven for your needs, that means you're supposed to feel your needs. But how can I feel my needs and feel lost in the momentum of coronating the king at the same time? The devil will say further, Masicha, if you ask a Jew once a year, forget about yourself. It's like a big thing also. Put yourself aside. Complete, divorce yourself from all your needs and focus on the king and only on the king. That's not easy, but it's understandable. Once a year, Shoshana, we could perhaps reach that level. But you're telling me to be in two worlds at the same time. Focus on your needs. Really feel what you need. Feel what you need and focus on the king. That seems to be, make up your mind. I can't be in two worlds at the same time. You understand what the question is? I can't focus on losing myself and feeling what I'm missing in life simultaneously. And yet with the same finesse, right? We have them both. How? And not that we made up, you know, what's Davin? What didn't come, we're not the ones who instituted Davening. It's from the great, the same people who instituted the words, coronate the king and forget about yourself, were the ones that instituted Daven for all your needs. It's the best time to daven for all your needs. How does that, how does that make sense? Yes. Well, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I had a question. Yeah. But you're saying that there's kind of, I guess my question was that there's a contradiction, right? Like, mm-hmm. like they literally just said, if you're asking for your needs, you're like likened to dogs. Like, and now they're saying, there's. Now we're saying that. Like, right. So saying, that, yeah. And, and, the, and the, yet, we, yet we're told in Shmanes, right? To ask for these very needs, which the Zara says you're like a dog if you ask for it. Is it supposed to like, are they trying to like say that your needs are just what Hashem, like, is it like your ultimate self, like your most authentic, like Hashem? Well, we'll see later. But it, yeah, but right now it seems like that you're, what you're asking for your needs, you're thinking about yourself. If, you're not, if I'm not thinking about myself, then I can't think about needs. If I'm not in the picture, then I have no needs. Like what does the show need for me so that he okay. can fulfill that so I can fulfill? Okay, we'll needs. get there. Okay, that's that's the direction we're going. Because if it's just if it's switching gears from Melech, 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 and everyone has becomes united, there's no individuality, it's all the king, 
then it's not the time to feel your needs. And it makes no sense. Especially with the Zohar saying that people just care about themselves are really selfish and it's not the, in the Ruach of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. So something's missing here. And that's what, we, that's, that's what we'll soon see how this fits into the whole Chana and Eili discussion exchange. Eili was very, very deep. And Chana recognized his depth. And she said, thank you, Eili. Let me go a step deeper. I agree with you. You're 100% right. But don't think that my davening for is, as you pointed out, that my davening for children is because I have friends and they all have baby carriages and all talking about their, you know, about their, about their family and about their babies. And I feel like out of it, you know, I feel so uncomfortable. I can't, I can't, you know, you know how it feels. You're a loner and you have no social life because you're nebuch. That's not what she was asking for. It's normal. It's a very normal feeling. And it's not, you can't blame a person for feeling that way. It's not being crude and, and grub and, you know, and, and grotesque and brute. It's being normal. But even that is too much. Ailey was, you know, was saying to her, can't you forget about yourself once and for all? Go dig deeper, dig deeper. Go to the Etzimah where the only thing that makes that you have, the only need you have is God. You're a Khan, I know who you are. You have great potential. He, he was a prophetess. Ailey understood who Khan was. I'm surprised at you. You of all people. Atmosai, why are you intoxicated with yourself? As Hannah responded, Ailey, you are living in a world of duality. You're living in a world where heaven and earth are two opposites. I'm transcending heaven. I'm going to a level, I will see in the Sikha later on how she agrees with him. That's why she doesn't say, how dare you put me down and saying, she, you're 100% right. You're 100% right that the focus should be only on God. I am exactly, I'm more focused than you can even imagine. I'm super focused. I'm so focused that I can see God in everything. I don't need, you think I need a child? So I shouldn't feel lonely? I need God to have a representative in this world. I need a tzaddik. I want, in fact, I'm gonna, what, what did she say? As soon as I have a child, he's going to the Mishamikdash. He's not my child. He's God's child. I need him because Hashem needs him, as you were pointing out. There's a story I wanted just to share with you, an interesting story. The Shliach in England also. Talk about England today. Shmuel Lu is his name. And he shared with us, he was a little bit uh, under the influence of of the real thing, of Mashke, and he said some private things. He said, I, I, I want to tell you a story. I used to hit my kids a lot. I lost myself. I felt like, you're ruining my, and I, my, my feeling was, you're ruining my name. You're, you know, I work so hard to you know, spend so much money on your education. That's what he was feeling. What? Did feel like a... Hitting them? Physically. Yeah, yeah Mamish. He lost his temper. He behaved this way. This is what I deserve. This is what I get back in return. That's how he was feeling. So he asked the Rebbe for an Eitzah, how to get rid of that problem. So the Rebbe asked him, do you also hit other kids or just your own kids? Do you hit other people's children? No. Why not? Because they're not mine. And the Rebbe looked at him. And you think your children are yours? It's a deposit. You're not here. These are not your children. These are Hashem's children. You're the caretakers. Not the, you know, it's not you. It's not, you know, like a father once told a daughter, when you'll pay when you'll pay back, she wanted a she wanted something for her, for her birthday. When you'll pay back all the expenses that I you know, all the years. And I mean, then, then we'll talk about it about your, your present for your birthday. I mean, it's not your child. These are not your children. These are Hashem's children, and everything you own is there. And we'll soon see in the Sikha how it fits perfectly with. Ailey's request. She wasn't disagreeing with him at all. But I want to go a little further because we're getting late here. So I want to go a little further. Let's see. Okay. So the next paragraph just simply re reiterates the question. On the one hand, Kaloma, Mitzad Echod, the last paragraph before hate. Mitzad Echod, yes, little choice. We have to want with his kavan and to have full kavan of the head filo to really mean that we want to be helped. That God should fulfill your request. Well, the same cock, if you want a God to, to answer your request, you have to feel that you have these needs. Yes, yes, you have to have the feeling, the hergish, the sensation of your existence 
and your identity as a person. Otherwise, you're davening and you're not really, you're not into it. But Yachad himself, together with that, yes, Likayim is Tamil Khuni Aleichim, you're supposed to crown Hashem as king. Davor, a matter Hadoresh, which requires his Batlut Mukhletas, absolute little of any kind of self expression, and therefore any kind of needs that are from self. How do we explain this? And the Rebbe says, you know, you might ask the same question, forget about Rosh Hashanah, you can ask the same question about every day we dive on we dive in we dive in we have our feet together, and you're not allowed to make even a gesture like this. Forget about talking, you can't even go, no, I'm sure that's all serious. No, no is a word, by the way. <laughs> you can't no, you can't even go like that, or gesture, make certain kinds of signals with your hands. You're complete standing in awe. And what do we say to God? I can't talk. Open up my lips. I can't even speak. First sentence before you even start. Hashem yagi. These are not my words. These are your words. And yet, what do we ask for throughout the entire almost the entire Shemana Esrei? All spiritual and physical needs. But I thought you're standing in front of God. So we have apparently the same paradox, not just on Rosh Hashanah, but throughout the year too. That is no, no. That I can really, that's not so difficult. Yes, it's true, we're standing before the king, but the king already is after he was coronated. He was already coronated. He accepted the kingdom. Now his job is to lead. Now he's asking, if you need something, I'm here for you. But stand with respect. You're standing right in the presence of the king. So stand with all, don't make any gestures. But you have the right to ask. Now is the time for asking. Because now I'm in the position of being your leader. I want you to believe that I can fulfill all your needs. Trust that I can fulfill your, all your needs. Stop with all your heart, with pittle. But this pittle is not nullifying your existence. It's nullifying your yeshes, perhaps, your ego, maybe. But it's not, you now want to feel yourself. On the contrary, you feel very much what you need. And you say, Hashem is the one that will take care of my needs. But for Shoshana, Hashem is not a provider yet. Then it's a time for, for oneness, for unity, for losing oneself in the oneness of Hashem beyond where he is a leader. That comes later. So that's the question. How could you be completely submerged in trying to relate to the king, not as a leader, but just to become one with him? And lose track of yourself, and yet at the same time have a whole davening devoted for taking care of all your needs. That's the question. So that will skip this back, this piece here. I will go to yes. So we are asking, like, so what we need to ask? So, to, like, I I want to ask to be a shira, okay? Shira. Shira. No. Okay, shidu. So I'm asking to be to have a shidu to make a shame will. So I'm asking something for myself, but I want to do it because Hashem wants me okay, to we'll, do it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> that's, the question, that's the main point? The main point, no. The main point of the question is that apparently when you're asking for your needs, you're thinking about yourself. And you can't think about yourself and coronate the king at the same time. It's two opposites. But if Hashem will that I will get married, he asked for me to get married. Is that what you're thinking about? That you have, Hashem, do you want to get married because Hashem wants you to get married or because you really want to get married? Well, maybe marriage is not a good example. <laughs> Uh, needs you have, are you doing it only, like for example, I want to have uh, Parnassa, I want to have children, is it, I don't really have any needs, but since Hashem wants me, otherwise, you know, the world, as we'll talk about, what, what do you really have in mind? That's the question. Do you really think about Hashem when you have your needs, or are you thinking about yourself? But me connect with Hashem. Okay, so, we'll get there. We're on the way. Yeah. I think I have a similar question, but I don't really know if it's the same, so I'm yeah. going to ask it, but like Hana was a prophetess, like she knew so much, you know, and we're, you know, generations past that. The sequel will address this. Like, how are we supposed to even know? Know what? Like what? Like she knows that she wants the son to give to Hashem. Right. And that's like, a, she has that knowledge. She has the insight. ultimate, right. And how are we supposed to ever know? Wait for the sikha. We haven't even talked about that in a second. You have to wait. <laughs> okay, so you're right. You're asking a very good question. 
let's first see what Kana is all about. Then we'll see how it fits into the average person who doesn't seem to be on Kana's level. Okay, so on the bottom of page 315, uh, that's where we got up to. Let's skip that hey. Let's go to Vav, page 316. I mean, we didn't really skip it because I said, I said it outside. How it, we, we understand how the whole year around, Davening Shvan Esrei is not a problem, not a contradiction. Well, on the one hand, you're davening with your feet together and you're in total awe, and yet you're asking about your needs. That's not a problem because he's already after the coronation. We're talking about how can you coronate, make him your king, while the same exact point you're asking for all the things that people want in life. Hezbollah Kakala says, just like this. What does the Abish to really want? What is Hashem? Let's say it outside. What is Hashem's Kavan? We all know the famous Medrash, which outside of Chabad is not so well known. Nisava, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Lea, Yisla, Yisbara, Dita B'Tach Tain. Hashem will want a dwelling place down here. Yes, this lowly world. It's hard to understand why he needs it. We don't understand how could Hashem have a need. But we know one thing, he had this taiva. And a taiva, you can't ask any questions. You're talking on a level where questions don't make any sense. You can only ask questions when there are rules. God creates the rules, so you can't ask questions on him. He had a taiva to find that this world should be a, uh, uh, an abode, a living quarters where he can feel comfortable dwelling in this world, where godliness can emerge from the world, not in spite of the world, but through the world, not imposing upon the world, but the world itself should generate godliness. That's what Hashem's taiva, that's why he created us. Uh, therefore, every individual deciding that you have a certain house you live in, certain clothing that you wear, certain uh, people you come in contact with. Why did you come in contact with this person? Why do you have this clothing? And why do you have this food and this housing? And someone else has different, different portion in their, their life? Because every single Jew has... A, his neshama, the soul of a Jew, has a certain connection, which only Hashem understands, connected to what is going on in your life. What provisions, what, what do you have? What type of food, what type of furniture you have in your home, uh, the exact furniture, the exact house you live in, the exact location where you live, the people you meet, everything in life, the children you have, Whatever you can think of that goes on in your life, and someone else has different different type of surroundings, and lives in a different type of home, and has different outfits, and has different, you know, food rations than you have. Every single individual, it's not just in general. Hashem wants to have a dita b'tachtoin. You are needed. You, if you don't have what you need, then God's. It's not you're missing. Hashem is missing. Hashem's plan that he should have a dita in every single Jew's life of this world, whatever you come in contact with in this world, there's sparks of, of holiness in everything, which means, what does that mean, sparks of holiness? It means there's a purpose in everything. And the fact that Hashem decided, dictated, that you should live uh, in a certain place, a certain city, in a certain house, and the house should have a certain feature to it, uh, whether it's homing, whether it's clothing, whether it's food, or, or anything you can think of, it's part of Hashem's plan. I want to, I want to be able to um, elevate this world. I want this world to become a, a uh, receptacle for godliness. If I don't have my needs, God doesn't have his needs, what you were saying. So, and Khan, of course, she for sure was saying to Ailey, do you think I'm davening because I need a child for my personal, I should feel good about myself and feel, have my better social life and I could feel comfortable talking with my friends? Why do I have a cleaning lady? I'm davening for a cleaning lady. Why do I need a cleaning lady? Because my house is a base on Mikdash. I need a Jewish home to look presentable, look holy. I have a lot of farm in my house. I want the home to be clean. I feel this is where Hashem has to reside. And I'm thinking I'm one track minded. Maloy chala Yes, indeed. King, I want God to be the one who runs the show every aspect of the world, including my own personal aspects. My personal needs are his needs. I'm not davening for myself. It's an outpour of the deepest part of my soul, which is connected to God's depth. 
deepest part. The Rebbe says something very fascinating later on in the Sikha. There's a portion in the Shmanesre that everyone cries, everyone gets serious, no matter how, you know, you know we get, we're sometimes apathetic, you know, we get bored of the Shmanesre, it's long, long, a lot of davening. There's one part of the davening where everyone stands and we start looking at it, look at the translation in English, you go, whoa, Excuse my voice. Then we meet who will live and who will not live this year, who will become rich, who will become poor. Who everyone gets. Well, God should have a, you know, a run the show. You know, Mazel Tov, God. I hope you have a good year. Hope you have better than Trump, you know, no indictments. Mm-hmm. You should have a good year. Thank you. you know, it's, 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 it's far from me. I wish you well. You're nice. Uh, if that's what you want, that's what you want. But when it comes to personal needs, everyone gets, now you're talking in my, lang- my language. That's the simple reason why people get excited. You know what the Rebbe says in the speaking here? Something fascinating later on. He says the real reason as to why people get jolted when they talk about whether you'll live or not, whether you'll have children or not, whether you'll come rich or poor, is because the Amish, the, the, the God's deepest will, the will of the essence of God himself, is to have a deed of a tachtainim. Your soul, the core of your soul, deepest part of your soul, senses the deepest part of God's will. And that's why when you say those words, you think you're excited because it's, um, I want to live. No, it's your neshama that's excited. And in fact, the Rebbe brings the Baal Shem Tov here. The Baal Shem Tov, because we're asking a question, okay, Chana was on a very high level. She was on a level where her gashmas and her ruchnias were all in sync. That's what she was telling Ailey. You have the masculine view. You see things as, and you're right, you're as a coin goggle, I understand your view. You're looking at absolute oneness with God and nothing else. Ain't no more and you can't see how a gosh music life and a spiritual life can somehow fit in with crowning Hashem as king. It seems like it's a contradiction. That's why you are reprimanding me, rebuking me. I have to let you know that I am not, by me, it's oneness. Heaven and earth are one. I don't see it as a, a duality. I don't see it as a, as, a, as a clash. My needs and Hashem to run the world is one and the same. That's the feminine view. The feminine view is, of course, you're 100% right. We have to think about God. That's exactly what I'm doing. But you think you can only think about God if you divorce yourself from the gashmis, from your, from your needs. But that's only if you look at yourself as something, as some, as, if you look at yourself as just who you are personally, then, then you're right. Then it's a contradiction to the oneness of Hashem, to the, to the crowning of Hashem as king. The word, in other words, on the one hand, you don't understand how small you are. But on the other hand, you don't know how great you are. You're very tiny. You're minute. You're a microcosm. You're nothing if all you think is just me. But if you realize that you are an ambassador, you are a, a manifestation of God's will of having a deed of a tachtainim, everything you need is God's needs. And Hannah really felt that way. Then that being the case, there's no contradiction whatsoever. On the contrary, it's she's saying to Ailey, my bittal to Hashem's malucha is manifest in my own needs. It's one and the same. It's, it's a, it's a con, continuum. Because I feel what you want me to feel, oneness of Hashem is exactly why I'm davening. It's the outpour of the deepest part of my soul. So the next question is, good for Hannah, what about us? We don't have that level. We're not, we're not Chanas. Well, you are. You have that name, but we're not on that level. So what about for us? So the Rebbe says the famous Bartol Hashem to be the Sikha. Powerful words in Tilim, chapter 107. The way it's explained without Chassidus, without Hashem, it was so different. People are hungry and people are thirsty. And so hungry and so thirsty that their soul is like enwrapped. You can be almost like you feel like you're bent over. I can't take it anymore. Just describing the, how deep the hunger is. Physical hunger. How does Hashem explain those words? When a person is hungry for food or for a drink, 
You think you're hungry for the food. The truth is it's not physical hunger. The body translates it in its own language. It's the soul hunger that's thirsty and hungry for elevating a spark, revealing the godliness that's in every single thing they eat or drink. But the body can't relate to the body is a mouthpiece. It's a biochemical signal from the soul that says, that food, food. But the hunger is explained in, in, in body language is simple hunger, physical hunger. The body can't relay the message of the soul perfectly. It explains it in baby language, in its own baby language. I am hungry. I remember when I was in South America, in Panama, Central America, actually. And uh, my broken Spanish didn't work so well, but I was met a kid there, wasn't religious. And we said this word of the Hashem to him, that when you're hungry, it's your soul that's hungry to find Hashem in the food you eat or in the drink, like whatever, and what do you drink? His eyes popped out of his head. Really? And somehow, it was like turned on, it turned the ignition on, the, on the Shama, and he decided he wants to put on stone every single day. I don't know how and why, but that's what happened. It's a powerful word. Well, Shemta was saying that when you, when your body says what it says, although it's speaking it's simple body language, it's really a mouthpiece, a signal coming from a much deeper level. It's coming from the neshama that's thirsty for being mevara the nisus. We're talking about when you're normally hungry, not when you, there's some people that keep on eating and eating and eating because they're nervous and they have problems. That's a different issue. We mean when you're hungry because it's time to eat. You haven't eaten for a while. Normal hunger is coming from the neshama. I know you might want to ask me what happens if it's not kosher food, right? Someone asked me this question. What about, so how, how do you explain it if it's not kosher, non kosher food, you can't elevate. So how come I have, uh, how come I, I have a hunger for non kosher food? The truth is you can have it also. How do you elevate the spark in the non kosher food? By not eating it. So your neshama is hungry for elevating that food, elevating, pre, pre, revealing the godliness in that non kosher food by you saying, God says not, therefore I won't. You think it's just hungry for the food. It's a hunger for, sometimes it's for eating, sometimes it's for not eating. And negative things, you mevara, but you, 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 you reveal the spark of Hashem in, in other words, the purpose of why is here, how do you reveal that purpose? By giving yourself the strength of overcoming your desire to eat something you can be eating. And likewise, it's not just food, it's everything in life. It doesn't have to be only food. It could be you have a desire to do something, kosher, hopefully. And the desire is not just, you think it's just, uh, you know, what you think. Really, it's coming from a much deeper part of the soul. So likewise, what the Rebbe says here in Masika, even if we really think only about our, at least mainly about our personal needs, it's really a, a manifestation. It's really a, a call from something much deeper than what you think you're calling for. You're really experiencing a Chana type of experience, but you just don't relate to it. Chana was able to relate to it, you know, openly on the surface. Her ability to relate her to, to, um, to connect the Gashmi with, with, with Hashem's oneness was real by her. By us, it's only real deep, deep down, many layers all the way back. On the surface, we don't sense it. We just feel, you know, that we want to have our needs. We're just thirsty and hungry for whatever helps us. Understand? So the Rebbe says, as long as the truth is that every single Jew's cry is internally really the cry of the neshama wanting Hashem to be the Melech, there's no contradiction. So even if we're not on that level, Go ahead and daven. Daven for your needs because it won't only be coming from that part of you which just, you know, relates to the, the material need. It's really a cry from the Shoma. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Even Rosh Hashanah, don't feel horrible if you're davening for your needs because it's really an expression of the soul's need to create a dira betachtonim, to make God's malucha to fulfill that promise of God's will. He wants to be a Melech. He can't be a Melech. He can't rule the world if we don't have what we need. If we don't have children and we don't have parnosa, we don't have money, we can't buy, we're poor and we don't have health, 
if we're not healthy and we're not, and we don't have any parnasa and we don't have children, we're missing in the ability of fulfilling that part of the world that belongs to us. And Hashem is a melech over every single person's needs. He can't fulfill, he can't be that melech if we're missing something. He's missing. Yeah. But what, if we don't, but what if we don't know that that's our portion and we're up to want? Like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, we don't know what Hashem like, has in store for us. So, so Children is a normal request. Sorry? Children and Panasa, everyone should have. Right. Yes, if you're asking for Ferrari, you're asking for who knows what. Oh. <laughs> Maybe not. But if you're asking for basic needs like children and, and, and being able, like, like you said, I don't ask for wealth, I'm asking for, I just want to have my needs. That's that's neat. You don't maybe know these particulars of where you're going to live, maybe, but you're asking, give me a home. I, I'm homeless right now. I need a home. If, I'm not, if I don't have a home, you can't have a home. In fact, it says in Chassid, there's a reason why people, uh, it says a person who doesn't have a home to live with is missing his identity as a person. More than food and, and clothing. If you don't have a home, it could be also a rented home. If you don't have a place, you're homeless, then you're missing your identity as a human being. And the devil once asked, the once asked, what is the reason for this? Why is it that people feel this incredible need? Because Hashem wants to have a deed of and we are connected with him. So we have that desire to have a home. Because it's a physical home. But because God wants a home, and the only home that he cares for is living here in this world, being popular, that this world should uh, be a, a place that generates godliness by nature, by its very nature, not like it's Hashem has to impose and force the world to comply to his wishes, but rather the world is welcoming to him. Because he has that desire, we have that desire. Yeah. So what's an example of a way this applies outside to the time that we have? <laughs> clothing, for example. You know, you want to have some nice clothing to wear, probably Shabbos. So uh, you think it's just to look nice. But to look presentable, a person, you're a queen, you're a royal. People that are religious should be looked upon. A Jew should always, a uh, Jew are king. We call kings, by the way. Call yourself the name Lachemheim. We are a royal people. Ask any Baptist, they'll tell you that. They believe that Jews are the chosen people. Jews have to, are the problems that don't believe in it. <laughs> Goyim know the truth. They don't have a they, they, Many of them know the truth. I had many interactions with Goyim, good Goyim, who, uh, wow. You are the chosen people. You are the amazing. They, they get crazy over Jewish music. They say uh, so many incredible things when they hear. Uh, they say, wow, I, I'm not Jewish. I, don't, I only wish I was. Or there's something, you, people are amazing. I mean, they, they sense it. They sense it's something special about us. We want, uh, I want to have a nice outfit. I want to look presentable so that it makes a good name. That people look at Jewish people and wow, so refined, so regal, so royal. Um, so your neshama wants, you might think about just, uh, you know, what looks, what suits me well. The truth is your neshama is thirsty for elevating that particular particular outfit you're wearing and uh, find the purpose that this, this, what's the purpose? That it should have a good, in, a good uh, influence and impact on the rest of the people, on, on the non-Jewish world, or even on, on many Jews who see a religious Jew looks decent, doesn't look slumpy. Doesn't look sloppy, you know. Cleanliness, clean, and looking besides clean, also looking, you know, wow, such a refined look. They respect it. The non-Jewish world respects. I'll tell you something. <laughs> Should we tell you? I once saw a an interview. Uh, these were not great people. These were pretty uh, grotesque type of individuals. They were asked, "Who would you rather, men?" They were asked, "Who would you rather uh, be with?" Picture had a picture of a real refined looking, royal looking woman dressed modestly, or you know what, the prostitute type. And 97% of all these hundreds of guys answered the one who's hard to get, the one who looks more regal. 
you know, the, the ones who look, uh, you know, who are begging for attention, they're not, they were not interested in. Uh, you know, no one respects those who are begging or, you know, are, are uh, demanding, please, I want to have, look at me. My sister was a, was a, um, a um, marriage counselor, therapist. She says uh, a good one-liner, better to be attractive than to be attracting. Because the more you try to attract, the less attractive you become. So people don't like, look, 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 you know. So you might feel, I'm just doing it because it makes me feel good about myself. But the real reason as to why you want it is because your neshama is thirsty to be mevara, to refute, to, re to reveal how clothing can mamas bring you closer to Hashem. It's mentioned by food more, but I think it implies not only food, it implies clothing, it implies housing and everything. Walking to a Jewish house, you know, right? wow, you have a beautiful home, Rabbi. Okay, the outside is not bad. She has all the books over there, you know, thousands of books, you know. A policeman came to my house just a couple weeks ago. Was, wow. And you know, they don't, they, they, it's none of their business to do that. Rabbi, you have a very beautiful home. Okay. Uh, you have all those books, and it's and they were they were very impressed with the with the aura of the surroundings. Uh, they don't see everything, <laughs> thank God, but they 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 did see the moment they saw a uh, you know a uh, you know, a lot of the sfarim in the house makes a just makes the house look holy. It's a dwelling place for Hashem, and it's everything. Think of everything you you think of: children having beautiful children. Having kinderlach, you know, serenity of a you know family. It was this President Johnson before he became president. It was a senator in uh, Texas. My uncle, my mother's brother, was very close with him. And President Johnson came to my uncle's house and saw all the kids on a Friday night saying Dibre Torah at the Shabbos table. He actually walked in. Wow, this is so beautiful. Wish we'd had this in our religion. Candle lights, the candles lit, the peace, the children all connected with her. Such a beautiful idea. They thought it's an idea, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's that. Um, we didn't finish the Sika, but maybe next week we'll finish the actual Sika inside. Thank you. How about a Yeah. Get back to Sika. So